We have just examined the fourth category of international armed conflicts that we have called for the purpose of this course traditional international armed conflict. They oppose the armed forces of two or several states or international organizations. The second category of international armed conflicts, which we will examine now, encompasses non-international armed conflicts that are internationalized because of the intervention of an outside state or an international organization. Third party intervention may take two forms. Direct intervention, when other states or international organizations intervene by sending their own troops or by accomplishing an act of war. Indirect intervention, when a state or an international organization intervenes by exercising some sort of control over an armed group engaged in a conflict within the territorial sovereign. Internationalized non-international armed conflict represent an important category of armed conflict because most recent non-international armed conflicts, be they in Afghanistan, Congo, the former Yugoslavia, Mali, Libya, Syria or Yemen have at some point been internationalized due to such direct or indirect interventions. Internationalized armed conflicts are not only increasingly common, they are also controversial because they sit uneasily between the two classical categories of armed conflict. Let's begin by distinguishing direct from indirect intervention. In case of direct intervention, three possibilities may be identified. Firstly, the fourth state or organization intervenes in support of the national government involved in a non-international armed conflict against an organized armed group. Secondly, the fourth state or organization intervenes in support of the armed group fighting the national government. Thirdly, both situations take place simultaneously. How to qualify these conflicts? One basic principle should always be remembered. The nature of the parties involved in this conflict dictates their qualification. This exercise should be performed separately for each actor. Therefore, operations led by or against armed groups will always be governed according to the rules applicable to non-international armed conflict. As we have seen in the previous video, operations carried out between two or more states or international organizations will always be international armed conflicts. The first consequence of this is that, as a matter of law, it is possible for two conflicts to exist in parallel. This scenario will arise when a fourth state or an international organization intervenes alongside the armed group to fight the national government. In this situation, we can see that two conflicts take place at the same time. The first one involving the national government and the fourth state is international in character. The second, involving the national government and the armed group, is non-international. The second consequence is that when a fourth party intervenes alongside the national government to fight an armed group, the conflict remains non-international. In this case, the nature of this internal conflict is not altered by the outside intervention. Of course, when several states and or organizations intervene alongside both the national government and the armed group, these solutions must be combined. In this latter case, the complexity of the nature of the new conflict increases considerably. 
Two important observations must be made regarding the process of direct intervention. Firstly, a minority of scholars consider that when interventions of four parties in concert with armed group against the national government acquire a certain level of intensity and duration, the totality of the conflict should be regulated as an international armed conflict. Therefore, the entirety of the conflict, including the relationship between armed groups and the national government, would be subjected to the full weight of IHL. According to this author, this approach would not only simplify the qualification process, but more practically would eliminate the risk of situations whereby different forces working towards a common goal would be subjected to separate legal regimes. Indeed, as we have seen, according to the traditional approach, state armed forces would be involved in an international armed conflict and therefore entitled to POW status, while armed groups would be fighting in a separate non-international armed conflict and would be punished for having taken up arms against the government. Secondly, it is important to emphasize that the concept of direct intervention is broader than a third party state or international organization committing armed forces to a conflict. Any other third party intervention that constitutes an act of war is also counted as direct in participation. Interventions that may be characterized as an act of war include any act which have a decisive impact on the conduct of hostilities, such as the transportation of troops to combat zones or the supply of weapons to be used for specific military attacks. That said, non-military support, whether economical or political, does not meet the threshold of direct intervention and thus does not have any impact on the nature of the hostilities. Otherwise, a very large number of states would be involved in every armed conflict. This situation would create dangerous consequences for individuals potentially submitted to IHL norms of conduct of hostilities and administrative detention. Let's now say a few words about the notion of indirect intervention. States or organizations can intervene on the side of an organized armed group, not by way of introduction of its armed forces or the accomplishment of an act of war, but through advising or directing the group in cases where this group is fighting against the national government. It is commonly accepted that where an armed group fighting against the national government act on behalf of another state or organization, there will be an international armed conflict. However, many controversies have occurred over the required level of control for the conflict to be transformed in this manner. We don't have the time to do these debates justice at this juncture. At present, it is sufficient to know the most authoritative test regarding the degree of control. In the ICTY Tadich Appeal judgment, the tribunal found that in order for the controlling influence of a fourth party to transform the nature of the conflict, it must be overarching. In other words, of the tribunal, the fourth party must have a role in organizing, coordinating or planning the military actions of military group in addition to financing, training and equipping or providing operational support to the group. In that case, the armed group may be regarded as a de facto state organ. Other ad hoc tribunals, the ICC and the ICRC, have adopted this test. As such, it may be argued to have attained a customary status.